Okay, without further ado, Story Engine in all of its glory. So uh, how many people here are completely new to Story Engine? Could you raise your hand or say hi? Okay, at least two hands, completely new. Okay, great. Lots of new people. So there's, I'm going to try teaching this a new way. The way I've always taught this in the past is I start on the left and I work my way over to the right. But one of the other instructors, Elizabeth and West, uh, suggested where we just start here in chapter one, where all the magic happens. And then I'll add more details as needed to the left. So, because I the really exciting part about Story Engine is this magic moment here when it goes ahead and it writes a whole chapter one. Um, just to, some other quick information before we get started is I'm Ryan and I'm the designer of pseudo right. So if you have complaints about the fonts or the buttons or the settings, etc, you can send them my way in the community slack. And uh, yeah, story engine is this tool that's like an AI native writing tool. There's other writing tools where you know you're basically in Google Docs and there's some buttons. But Story Engine is a way of writing with AI that like really leans into what the AI is good at and helps you keep your story straight as you go. So the AI doesn't get confused and forget important things. So what I'm looking at right now, and I'll explain everything to the left later, but I thought that what I would do is start where the action is at the end and then retrace my steps and explain everything. So what we're looking at right now is chapter one of this story. This is a story about a retired wizard who intends on living out his golden years in a coastal dwarven mining town. After years of adventuring and hardship, he's pursuing a lifelong dream to learn dwarvish. And so all I know so far, I'm kind of like pantsing my way through this, is that there's this retired wizard I really like. I just have this interest in stories about retired adventurers for some reason. And uh, I speak with lots of retired people in these pseudo right classes. So I'm interested in retirement right now as a writing topic. And I wrote down a very sparse outline. You need something in the outline here for story engine to work. But all I really know is the beginning. I have this idea of he arrives on a cruise ship to this dwarven town and he expects to be doing a dwarvish language intensive but when they get there uh this the, the city's empty and i thought it would be funny if when they get there they do this magic language pledge so they can't speak their mother tongue they, they can only speak dwarvish but none of them actually know any dwarvish yet so they're gonna struggle to communicate with each other uh because they can only speak in Dorvish, but they can't really say anything. And I think it will be funny. And hopefully uh, the wizard, hopefully pseudo Wright will be able to write it correctly. My hope is that the wizard is going to stubbornly not want to help with the mystery because he just retired from adventuring. And uh, he will go ahead and leave town when he gets super annoyed with everyone asking him for help in broken dwarvish. So that's basically what's happening here. We've got this retired wizard. Everyone's going to ask him for help, but he's just here to learn dwarvish. So he's not going to want to help. So I'm going to click this button here, which is generate most accurate. Most accurate is the model, which is the best at following complex instructions. So these things right here, these are called beats. And these are like a mini outline that is just for this chapter. You can also think of them as instructions for a junior writing partner. So for example, describe the Elvish cruise en route to Ikora. That's not really like an outline. It's not really what you put in an outline. It's more of like describing how you write the outline to a junior writing partner. So I've got these beats here. You want to make sure that the beats are meaty enough that you can write a couple hundred words to them because that's what the AI is going to have to do. And you also want to make sure that they are clear enough on their own that there's no important ambiguities 
that the AI could get confused by. So for example, you can see in beat three here, I reiterated that they're going to struggle to communicate because they signed, they did a magic language pledge, which prevents them from speaking their native tongues. I had already mentioned this in beat two, but I, re I reiterated it in beat three because I didn't want the AI to get confused. If I just say they struggle to communicate, it, there's a bunch of different ways to interpret that. So with your, with your beats, you wanna make sure that there's enough in here that the AI can write to, and you wanna make sure that it's clear enough. So here we have the pros and uh, you can see here, it's still going. Right now we're sitting at 496, five or six words and it'll keep going. I haven't actually read these later beats, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm only really interested in one, two, three, four for now. And for the purposes of this class in our limited time, I'm probably going to pause it now that it's in three, four. When you hit pause, it'll keep going uh, until the end of this batch sure. of beats. It writes them in batches of two. We call okay. it stride. So let's start reading what prose is creating for us. I'll kind of skim read it because if I read it word for word, it'll take too long. The glistening sun cast a warm glow upon the deck of the Elvish cruise ship as it cut through the sea. Ah, my friend, those days of correcting essays and disciplining naughty students are far behind me. Indeed, chimed in a wizened cobbler. I won't miss those endless hours hunched over my workshop. But I will cherish the friendships made with customers and fellow craftsmen. So immediately I'm noticing the tone of this writing is like a little too uh, kumbaya, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. I have left completely empty the genre and style boxes here. Ryan. So later we'll, we'll try revisiting that. Ryan. Yes. I, uh, I figure out something because I write with true story and based on true story, I, in my, in my, uh, beats on each beats, because the, sometimes the beats change, like I say, one, one beat is, is written with humor. And the one is more dramatical because it's the chapter. There's some different way of writing it. So I put right in front of the, uh, or before the three or the five. And I says, this part, I want it to be humorous. I put it between brackets. Mm. And it does very, very well. Yeah. Yeah, you can put it either, you can put special instructions either here right after the number, right after the number, or here at the end. I would caution against putting it here because the, the way it gets parsed, it might interpret this as relating to two because it kind of looks for the numbers and how it chunks it up. So just keep that in mind. If you run into anything Thank weird, you. It might have to do with how you format it. We'll try to make that more robust over time, but that's a good tip. Let's finish. Um, I'll get to your questions in a second, but let's finish reviewing this prose. Uh, so what's it? Attention, attention, everyone, the leader of the cruise. The time has come for our language pledge ceremony. As you know, part of this journey is not only to enjoy your retirement, but also to learn the rich and ancient language of Dorvish. Whispers of excitement rippled through the crowd as Lysander instructed everyone to join hands. Telemaeus felt the reassuring grip of an elderly seamstress on one side and a robust ex-blacksmith ex on the other. Their eyes met briefly, conveying a shared sense of anticipation. Uh, so yeah, I would... Personally, I would just cut this. One thing to always remember with Story Engine, there's this thing called nerd sniping. Nerd sniping is when there's a fascinating problem and it distracts you from actually achieving your goal because you just get distracted on like, oh, I need to solve this problem. So what you might, your first instinct probably using Story Engine will be like, oh, I, I have to edit my style box to remove this like telly prose conveying a shared sense of anticipation. But uh, my actual, my, my uh, battle-tested battle 
experience using story engine would actually suggest to just delete it it's uh, so much easier to just press the delete button than to try to dial in the perfect style by participating in this ceremony you are committing to speak only dwarvish from the moment on until we re our return voyage Ptolemaeus closed his eyes, feeling a sudden urge of energy, cursing through their linked hands, a tingling sensation spread from his fingertips. Open your eyes, Lysander commanded. Ptolemaeus blinked, realizing instantly that his native tongue had been replaced by Dwarvish. The rock off, he explained to the seamstress behind him, testing out his newfound linguistic abilities. Grumbar Kazad, he, she responded with a delighted giggle. I like that it's actually not explaining what any of these things mean um as the passengers continued to marvel at their magically acquired language skills telemaeus couldn't help but feel a sense of camaraderie forming among them he sensed that this journey would not only just be about relaxation and retirement but also fostering new connections and embracing the unknown so yeah i would just delete that it's easier that uh than trying to work it out the ai just likes to explain too much but i want to show you how actually the other model for prose differs from this one. And uh, I'll set it up and then I'll take questions while it's generating. So one thing to note here is that you can create multiple copies of the same chapter. So I just clicked create chapter here, it created this copy. You can click show more just to verify that this is the same chap that, you know, the chapter that I intend to write here. As you get deeper into the story, there'll be more and more chapters here. You can copy and paste the beats in here. There's actually a copy button, which you can use that works. So I'm going to get this kicked off to generate with the best prose model. And the best prose model, you can think of, I like to think of most accurate as like a lawyer or something where their writing is very precise and they really follow instructions well. Whereas best prose is like a creative writing major from a liberal arts college. You've got like lawyer from Harvard in most accurate. And then you've got creative writing major from like, I don't know, Bryn Moore or something for uh, best prose. I tend to like reading best prose more, but it, it might get confused about the language pledge. Let's see. Um, and I'll hit pause here since it's going further. Okay, now I will pause to answer some of the raised hands. Sia, Saya, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sia. Uh, all right. Yeah, I was playing around with Story Engine. Um, I'm completely new to Sid Ride. This is my first month experimenting with it. Um, and I've read a couple of Slack um, recommendations. It's to guide POVs, um, like first perspective, third, uh, et cetera, to add settings and styles on top of uh, above all beats. But what I find that does, for some reason, Story Engine gets confused about the beats and it starts with the last then it renumbers and goes through all the other beats and then it finishes with the last. So it's like the information from the last beat is repeated both in the beginning and in the end. If I add the square brackets above the first beat, like right uh, on top to set the beat. Yeah, for what it's worth, uh, it's not really like a battle tested thing to like do stuff up here. Personally, mm. I've never done it. There are other people who swear by it and do it a lot. I'm not sure if there are any parsing issues that could occur with how the thing works. I'm not familiar with the code for how it processes everything, but what it's expecting in beats is a numbered list, one period and then a beat. And then if you wanna do the square bracket things, you could do them here. Um, so I just duplicate it, the message that I want. What's the message that we have. want? What is it exactly? Uh, not, not the message, but like write it in first person specific characters, yeah. POV, for example. And I want the entire chapter to be written like that. I, I believe the way you should do this, put this in style. Style is actually 
the last thing that the AI looks at prior to writing prose. And we'll go over that in a second. And, uh, and then if for whatever reason it's struggling, like let's say for example, I'm writing a beat and the beat mentions Telemaeus by name, but I want it to be written from this other guy's point of view, Lysander. Uh, then I might reiterate in square brackets at the end, like reminder, right from Lysander's point of view, like this. And uh, just to clarify, in case it was unclear, this style box, you can and probably should tweak it on a chapter by chapter basis. So if one chapter is really cheerful, you might say it's like, you know, filled with joyful little surprises. And then during the dark night of the soul, as part of the book, you might be like pretty dark. You are allowed to explore, you know, violent and, you know, suicidal thoughts or whatever you want to convince that, tell the AI that it's allowed to be really, really dark. So th those are my thoughts on what might help with that specific problem. We won't be able to debug it in detail in this meeting because we have limited time, but that's where I would recommend experimenting with. Cool, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna skim read the best prose section and then we'll get to the next question. Thanks for your patience. So, okay, the sun dipped low in the sky, golden light shimmering across the rolling waves of the serene sea. So already, first sentence, I already like it better. I have some confirmation bias, but uh, most accurate describes the sea as azure. But best prose describes it as golden, which I feel like is better match for the theme because it's the golden years, it's retirement sunset and kind of has a nice harmony to it. And uh, I also just have a, it, it conjures a much more unique and vivid image in my head, setting the scene. So first detail already better. I also I that it gave up. the sea a name. No. I'm not sure if someone's trying to ask a question or if there's a background noise. Pelomaeus leaned against the railing of the elven cruise ship, a mug of ale in hand, breathed in the salt air. Around him, other elven retirees laughed and danced to a lively tune, played by a band of gnomes. Do you remember that troublemaker, Legolas? Okay, so <laughs> sometimes the AI will introduce <laughs> common uh, cultural touch points. It doesn't know if you're trying to write original IP or if you're just posting to Reddit. So you have a little bit of responsibility here to, uh, you know, not plagiarize. So uh, I'll rename Legolas here to Hodar. Oh, he's shooting his arrows where he should. <laughs> Delamea snorted his ale, remembering his own days, trying to wrangle unruly elflings. A bell chimed, signaling the start of daily language pledge ceremony. The leader of their crews, an eccentric elf named Adeline. So if you wanted to specify a name for the leader, you would add it to the characters box. I only have a description of the town and Telemaeus, the wizard, because I'm kind of pantsing my way through. But if you get to the point where you want to add that character, that's where you add them. Uh, so repeat after me, Azg Ujme Menu Galek. I'm going to do all of my classes with Dorvish from now on, because it's really fun for me to read the Dorvish out loud. Telemaeus stumbled over the foreign words, his tongue clumsy in his mouth. The other elves spoke in unison. Satisfied, they released hands. The numbness faded, but Telemaeus frowned at the prospect of being unable to communicate his native tongue. He took another swig of ale. At least the view made up for it. And then sometimes the AI will include this like dossier at the end explaining, you know, what it did. The scene follows the requested 40% dialogue, yada, yada, yada. 30% internal thoughts ratio. So for example, this clarifies why I got some of those internal thoughts that I didn't want. 
establishes the setting, develops the character of Ptolemaeus, shows the language pledge ceremony, yada, yada, yada. So I'll just delete this. So already you can start to see some differences between best prose and most accurate. By the way, these settings are like across the whole project. So if you want to remember which is which, you can just write a little label at the top. I personally am I'm partial to the best prose one. It introduced the golden color and the drinking of ale, which is I think a nice touch because it resonates with the theme and setting. So the ship when, right. when you when you um, went to the second when you went to the best pros as opposed to the most accurate, and you have two different versions of your first chapter there. How do you when you were working on it first in in ac as accurate? Um, where do you tell the story engine that you want another chapter of the? but but in an, in the prose instead. Yeah, so the way that you create new chapters is in here. In but, you, but you said it wasn't a new chapter. It was just a, a, a copy version of that. Yeah, so if you want to make a copy, just choose the chapter you want the copy of and then click create chapter. And you so you can just stick it anywhere you want it? It automatically adds it to the end. And it actually, there's a bug where sometimes it reorders them. If I refresh the page, um, it's just, it's a temporary bug, but we haven't been able to fix it. Uh, just, we haven't been able to prioritize it. So you can see that now actually the order is basically flipped. <laughs> yeah. when, you re when you refresh the page, the order gets flipped. So that's why I recommend writing the labels here. Okay. But yeah, you can delete them. Once you delete it, it's gone forever. Also, there is a button here at the bottom. I don't know how many of you are new to PseudoWrite as well as Story Engine, but the rest of PseudoWrite operates in documents like this. So there's a, I, what I did is I clicked the send to doc button in Story Engine. And that's a way to, you know, advance a draft forward past the original you know, story engine drafting phase. So I wish we could read these whole, you know, this whole thing in uh, vivid detail. Let me see. Ptolemaeus bristled at the order. Thought he couldn't deny the prickle of unease along his neck. Ugh, menu. As gujme. So actually best prose... Um, best prose actually understood what I meant better with the whole language issue in the best prose when it gave them the ability to speak dwarvish Nate, like fluently, which I didn't want. I wanted them to be like struggling and saying, saying things like people zero <laughs> find go find. I thought that would be funny. They couldn't understand each other. Um, so Let's go ahead and explore a little bit more of what Story Engine has, because there's more to it than just generating prose from beats. So for example, one of the things that I noticed is that there yes. were more internal thoughts and telling that I wanted. So uh, you can go ahead and go in the style box and describe the style of writing that you want. I like to say things like, um, I like to say witty and quirky details. I'm, personally, I love books that have, it's like I'm a sucker for Perry Pratchett and Wes Anderson and stuff like that. In me is Hayao Miyazaki. I like that kind of unique world building details. So I'll add that. Um, I'm going to write show don't tell, although to be honest, I think that show don't tell isn't a super influential thing to put in style. It knows that it's supposed to show don't tell, but sometimes this, if you describe the beat in such a vague way, it has a hard time uh, 
bridging that gap between the beat and a proper show don't tell writing of the beat. So what I'm going to do here is instead of just saying show don't tell, I'm going to unpack that a little bit. Show don't tell. Uh, focus on character action dialogue and sensory descriptions. Um, I'm also going to say you are allowed to write dark and um, explicit content. I don't actually think that I'm going to have any dark and explicit content, but I kind of want to put this in just to see if I get less of the kumbaya vibe that I'm getting. Genre, I'm actually going to leave genre blank because personally, I'm not much of a fan of tropey fantasy. If you liked that, or if you're familiar with what your audience likes and you really you know, want to lean into to tropes, then uh, you can use this to your advantage. We also have brain dumps. Brain dump. So the the another way to use Story Engine is you start out with the brain dump, and you can put anything in here. I could have put my description of Telemaeus and Ikora in there, but if you already have other parts of the story written, you can use brain dump as a kind of world building document for your story. So I could say in this world. All magic is done by speaking phrases. The language pledge only prevents uh, participants from speaking their native tongue. It doesn't infer new language capabilities. I don't know if this will actually work here, but it might. Similarly, synopsis, you can hover over these question marks to see what each box does. So the synopsis section is generated based on brain dump and genre. So that's another reason to fill out genre is if you're going left to right. But the synopsis is only used to generate, actually, that's not true. Synopsis is used for a couple things. It's used to generate the characters. And then it's used to generate the outline. You can see that here. This section is generated based on genre, synopsis, synopsis and characters. And then Beats actually looks at the synopsis too. So you can see this says Beats looks at everything. Brain dump, genre, style, synopsis, characters, outline. But if you leave things empty, that's okay. The only thing that you can't leave empty is there needs to be at least a husk of an outline. You can actually, I believe you can delete the contents of the outline. And then let's see if I go to click generate chapter two. It lets you generate it, even though there's nothing in here. And so if you really want to pants with Story Engine, you don't even really need, you know, you can just write the word the. I don't know if it even needs anything there, but it does need some sort of a husk of an outline there so that it knows how many chapters your story is. And I'll use this opportunity to show one more thing. I'll get to your question in a second, Jackson, which is history. So if you click that clock icon, it will actually show you all the previous versions of this box. And so if I wanna restore what I had there, I can click restore and now it's back. Uh, now I'll pause for some questions. Uh, where's the clock icon? It is up here next to generate. Oh, okay. Uh, Jackson? Okay, um, whenever you use the square braces, does that mean a special instruction to Story Engine? So, yes and no. So, I would say it works like a special instruction, but it does not mean 
there's no programming in there that says like everything in square brackets should be interpreted as a special command. Mm -hmm. uh, under the hood, it's a language model. And the language model is trained on much of the internet. And if you look at all the text on the internet and you study it all, and then someone says to you like, hey, what's the deal with square brackets? You would summarize it and say, oh, well, usually people put stuff in square brackets that's like a aside, like some sort of supplementary information, like a citation or a note to the reader or something like that. So the, the AI model has learned generally that if you put something in square brackets, you're, it's not just a continuation of the story. It's not just a continuation of the prose. It's like some kind of fourth wall breaking text. And so if you put a command in there, it reads it that way. But there, that's not to say that other forms of syntax wouldn't also work. So if, for example- If you ask it to, uh, to do something new, does it, and, and you're in a chapter, does it go back to the beginning of the chapter and change whatever you asked it to do this, change the style or whatever? Or is, is, it, is it just from the, the place where you put the bracket? Um, good question. I'm not, let me see if I can answer it. So what happens when you click these generate buttons? Yeah. What it does is it checks all the other boxes and it it pulls in the most recent information across all the boxes. Okay. So if you if you edited this and added a command to it, which is like make sure to always describe Cora with sensory description or you know sensory details not generic teleprose something like that if i then click uh generate beats because beats looks at the characters box it will pull in this and if there's anything about describing ikora it will keep in it will you know take this into account okay there is some randomness to the machine. So you can't always rely on it working 100% of the time can, in a consistent, you know, predictable way because it's AI and AI is, you know, at least as random as <clears throat> writers, human writers are, which I think- Ryan, is what is the AI engine that you use behind this? We have multiple. So best prose is uh, Claude by Anthropic. Mm -hmm. Most accurate is GPT-4. Uh, fastest is GPT-3.5. Mm. By the way, fastest is like super duper fast. Uh, and my I question- I really recommend fastest because it's not as- Fast and dirty. <clears throat> yeah question about that is that um, I've been using Pseudowrite for some time and I know how my word count gets counted um, mm -hmm. against my subscription. How does it get counted here? What so part of this question. is counted as words? Good question. So basically every word that is printed out into a box counts as a part of your quota. So if I go here and I click fastest and I put some beats in here, all that will be counted against quota. If I delete the whole thing, it's still counted as my quota. If I print it out and uh, snail mail it to my grandma, it doesn't matter. Uh, all that matters is that it got printed in the box here. But uh, the beats are what I put in. Yeah, so if you type it in, it does not count as a part of your quota. Right. So that's, uh, I personally recommend typing in this thing as much as you feel inspired to. One thing to know about AI generally is that um, it assumes that everything is kind of a implicit guide for what you want. It's trying to read in between the lines and kind of monkey see, monkey do its way through the book. So 
if you just leave what it what you get from the purple buttons and you don't change it that the voice of the ai will just kind of become kind of entrenched and like more and more set so i recommend like making it your own and adding your own ideas and your own writing into the thing as you go from start to finish and then i think you end up with something that feels like closer to your point of view and your style like in this best pros one like this as Ushme menu galak like i've never seen story engine do anything like this exactly and i think it's because i put a lot of my these beats here like i hand wrote uh, a lot of this myself so i think that that's where some of that uniqueness comes from uh well, first Dave, of all sorry uh john uh genre uh, how flexible is that uh, action adventure or should I use thriller? Um, I don't know. You can really put anything in there technically. I uh, There's a lot of people that recommend putting subgenres and tropes like you could put romance, enemies to lovers. Um, okay. You know, meet cute. And then you could also be like with a sprinkling of dark horror. Theoretically, that could work. I think that the a new I just had a new principle that I just thought of. If you're doing something that's nuanced and like kind of out of the ordinary. I think that what you want to do is you want to corroborate this information across the rest of story engine. So you might reinforce in beats, like uh, there should be an ominous horror feel here. I think that oftentimes when the AI struggles, you can think of it as failing to bridge a gap between the ideas that you have going on. And so you can think of these as little bridges that are connecting those out of the ordinary or nuanced ideas for the AI so that it's a little bit easier. Because like this genre description is so tricky. Like, how do I know when to sprinkle in the horror? Like you haven't told me. So it's really relying on it, doing a lot of thinking. I like to imagine that the AI at any given point in time, it's got, you know, it can think about roughly seven, eight, nine things all at once. It can't think about infinite things all at once. And so if you write, if your story engine is like, you know, crazy detailed and it's got like all these characters and these subplots and these genres and these subgenres and a style with nine and 10 points, eventually it will overwhelm the AI because it doesn't, it basically loses sense of the priority. Like what exactly is important here? So another thing I recommend generally is if things aren't working out for whatever reason, just try like simplifying everything, remove information from different boxes. As you saw, I was able to create chapter one with, you know, one character, no synopsis, no genre, no style, and you can still get some pretty interesting stuff out of it. So, and I would say with just one more thing, which is that you can think of the art of story engine as the art of deciding what's relevant or what is important. So for example, one author might think that really it's all about characters and they write about their characters in a lot of detail and then the rest, they kind of leave open. And this author will probably get a pretty different result than another author that's like all about world building. And they create these like massive documents detailing every house and every shop in the city and the, you know, economics and government of this town. And so I would invite you to play with different, uh, different kinds of information that you put in here and see, see how that influences the outputs you get. Um, Nancy, I see your question about fastest gives me a little and stops or does not give me anything. So that it should not do that. Um, I haven't used it, 
for weeks. So I don't know if it works or not. You can try using it now and see if it see if it works. If it doesn't work, I will let the developers know and they'll fix it. Let's see if it works. I don't think it's a problem with fastest. I had the same problem this week with most accurate where by beat six, it would stop abruptly in the middle of a sentence. I had it at least twice and I had to generate uh, the chapter three times each chapter to get That's there. Three times, where are you based? Israel. Okay, interesting. I'm starting to think that this might happen more with people who have a, like a distance to the data centers. We've actually done a lot of investigation on this issue and it is like surprisingly uh, hard to know what's going on. Uh, as far as we can tell, there's no bug on our end. So it seems to be something with the API infrastructure. We don't know exactly. We actually had a lot of work we did with the, I'm getting a little bit into the nitty gritty, but <laughs> there's like various layers of the stack. There's like our servers, and then we have open AI and cloud servers. Interestingly, the error rate for cloud best pros is way lower than most accurate for some reason, which is the open AI one. So part of the issue has to do about the open AI API latency, I think. Um, how how long did you wait? Did you wait like upwards of a minute? Because sometimes it will stall for like 30 seconds or or more. Oh it's yeah, no, I, I start generating and then I go do something with my kid, for example, come back and it, it's upwards of like six minutes. Okay, interesting. What I've what well, I've experienced with uh, Chat GPT four or whatever uh, is that it's a shared number of tokens between your your prompt and the response. So if you put too much information in the prompt, sometimes it, the response is very very short and it ends abruptly because it ran out of tokens. So that might be what's happening. That's an interesting idea. Um, I'm not sure if we have investigated, done an audit to verify that all of our messages are coming under budget from a, a sort of word count point of view. I'll clarify on that because that would explain the discrepancy between Claude and OpenAI. Uh, because they have different context windows. And I believe that the Claude one might be bigger, but I don't, don't quote me on that. That would explain and fit my theory as well, because I'm very heavy on input data. Like beats are almost all 2,000 words and the okay, characters, there's everything. Yeah, we'll, we'll try investigating that. That's a good idea. Thanks for chiming in with that idea. The... the the, what I'm trying to understand actually uh, is uh, you have the style and genre and those things that apply to the whole book, arguably, and then you have specific instructions you can give down at the beat level. Do you put special instructions at the beginning of a chapter that will apply to a whole chapter or how's that work? So you can do that. Um, I haven't done it much, so I don't really know how reliable it is. So I don't really want to recommend it because I don't know how reliable it is, but there's some people in here that in the community in Slack that swear by it. So they call it a header and they'll write stuff like, this entire chapter is written in iambic pentameter. <laughs> and then if you do most accurate, we'll click generate and see, oh, I said pedometer, that might screw it. Screw it up. Upon a ship of elvish make to Ikora's shores they sail. With party goers, retirees, their laughter rang and hailed. Vessel filled with merry folk in search of peace and leisure to spend their days in warm embrace and mine the diamond's treasure. <laughs> oh, he cried one, a teacher passed, her voice a soft soprano. Days gone by, we reminisce when life was but a piano. So 
such as to say you can do that and it may or may not work. I don't want to guarantee it, but it's something that you can try. Thanks. Um, L. I'm thinking of Death Note. Do you have a question? Actually, no, I don't know how I managed to get my hand up on the screen. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I was busy. I was busy listening to what you were saying about um some that maybe this funny generation of text has got to do with how far one is away from the place. So sorry, I must have pressed something by mistake. But no worries. You. Yeah, it's just an, an idea I have is that maybe it has something to do with the latency between the data centers of the API, but I'm not sure if that actually is a thing. Any other questions? I'll yeah, look at can, the chat. Can, can you um, put in the genre and the and all the the special information at the beginning and then just have this synopsis uh be, be generated without it going on to actually write the chapters yes so let, let's go ahead and try that uh let's see what kind of synopsis we get so i'm going to try taking my character info and then putting that in brain dump because so let's imagine that i never got past synopsis yeah and then for genre, I'll say uh, humorous, fantasy. I'm gonna I'm gonna say romance sub theme, or sub genre. Uh, style, I'll leave that alone. And then click generate synopsis. Ptolemaeus, a retired elf wizard, has spent his life seeking adventure, but now he seeks a new kind of challenge. He settled down in the coastal dwarven mining town of Ikora to pursue a lifelong dream, learning dwarvish. Ikora is a place where time moves slowly. The people are welcoming and relaxed. He struggles to master dwarvish, but begins noticing the growing tension in Ikora. One day, when exploring the nearby mountains, he stumbles upon a group of miners who have discovered the new vein of diamond. They're arguing over how to divide the wealth and things quickly turn violent. In the chaos, Ptolemaeus is knocked unconscious. When he awakens, he finds himself in the care of a young dwarf named Kelda. She has been nursing him back to health in secret. She knows that her fellow miners would not look kindly on her helping an outsider. So it's incorporating the romance uh, subgenre. As they work together to unravel the mystery, Ptolemaeus must confront his fears, learn to trust others again. So that's one way you could do it. You could do rewrite synopsis. I recommend using rewrite synopsis only when you want to make wholesale changes. If you want to just change a certain character's name, I would just go ahead and change it manually because it does, you know, you do use up words for rewrite. Right. So I would use rewrite for things like, this is way too boring. I need more conflict obstacles and drama please spice it up such that a hollywood producer would be foaming at the mouth to green light this project rewrite you may find that the more persuasive your instructions are the more successful your results are because it is meant to process language like a human. So persuasive writing is more, more persuasive than unpersuasive writing. Let's see if we got something else new. Tensions rise as they argue how to divide the wealth happens much sooner. Uh, da, da, da. He's knocked unconscious again and is under the care of Kelda. And, but then instead they devise a plan to bring peace to the town and share wealth. They're threatened by an unexpected betrayal from within, though. So more drama, more conflict. As they work to unravel the mystery, Ptolemaeus discovers that his desire for adventure has been replaced by a desire to make a difference in the world. So again, if you are allergic to the kumbaya aspect, you could say, uh, this is way to kumbaya. Please make it dark and gritty such that even Stephen King will be afraid to read this book. 
and then you may you may that may work i don't know <laughs> we would have to do more experimentation okay uh any other questions i had a question in the chat um i've been using prompts like use save the cat structure or hallmark christmas movie structure in chat gpt does that work in pseudo write as well when i'm planning the, when i'm getting the outline Sorry, I got distracted reading the chat. Could you ask the question one more time? Um, I've been using specific prompts for the outline, telling chat GPT, like save the cat structure or yeah. Hallmark Christmas movie structure that works well in pseudo write as well, correct? Um, in other parts of pseudo write, it could work. Uh, for our outline, our outline actually doesn't have that. We will be adding a save the cat inspired outline structure to outline and so there will be a drop down here at some point in time where you can just choose it save the cat yeah adapting save the cat for novels is a little bit different um, than for films so i would caution i would warn you um to just to make sure that your chap like chapters are good chapters sometimes the save the cat movie uh structure doesn't doesn't translate perfectly to books if you're writing books i don't know what you're writing maybe you're writing a screenplay in which case yeah save the cats the bible uh, thank you uh i want to answer this question about plagiarism i would just i would say fast answer for anyone who's trying to leave on time is fill story engine with unique and interesting details that are of your own creation and you will be pretty safe. Um, I'll go ahead and show you something on our homepage. I won't go over it in detail, but you, I recommend you check this out. There's a section on our homepage called AI 101 and there it shows you when the AI creates very original prose. That's this like rainbow colored section. And when the AI plagiarizes. So if I put in the first sentence of Harry Potter, I get the next two sentences of Harry Potter with like 99.99% .99 accuracy. That's because you can think of the AI as a junior writing partner slash librarian. And it really tries to follow your instructions and frankly, and, you know, it doesn't know what you're doing and it assumes that you're not plagiarizing. So, for example, if I'm writing a uh, essay criticizing J.K. Rowling, maybe I want to include a snippet of the first page of Harry Potter. And if I click, you know, write, I intend it to, you know, show, finish the snippet. So... The best way to avoid this is to not put in other source material. So for example, if I just change the names and the sentence, I didn't change that much about it, but instead of it saying they were perfectly normal, thank you very much, it said reluctant to admit they lived very normal lives. And then you'll notice that the stuff that came after it, you get that kind of rainbow color, which means that each word has varying percentage chance of being chosen, which means it will be uh, pretty unique. Now, in terms of in when we were showing Story Engine, I got uh, Legolas as a name, despite not putting any Lord of the Rings stuff in there. So the other place where that kind of stuff can happen is if you just haven't given it that much to go off of. Like if I say, you know, write me a story about a wizard, it might, you know, there's a there's always like a five percent chance or a ten percent chance that it will say there you, there once was a wizard named Gandalf and he went into the mountains. I think that for those ones, it's going to be quite obvious if you're plagiarizing. And it's, uh, I think it's also nuanced in terms of plagiarism. Like there's a lot of, uh, there's probably another, I don't know, is there another story out there with a wizard named Telemaeus? Um, I, I hope I'm not plagiarizing. To my knowledge, I'm not plagiarizing, <laughs> but uh, maybe I am. So I think similar rules kind of apply from human written plagiarism to machine generated plagiarism, where 
you know, if you're, if you're, if it just so happens to be similar to something else, that's not really plagiarism as, as far as I'm aware. Like for example, uh, particularly like with stuff that's very common in a genre, like, oh, I have a character, yeah, there's an enemies to lovers narrative in this story that takes place in space or something. There's probably a lot of books that fit that description. So my gen general answer is to add a lot of your own ideas and it will be unlikely Yes, I do recommend trying plagiarism checkers. Uh, in response to the question about AI detectors, there are a variety of AI detectors. There's also a lot of like researchers in academia that are studying AI detection as a research project. None of the ones that I've seen so far that are publicly available are particularly reliable. Like, I think someone in the Sudarai community oh said they put the Bible in and it said the Bible is 70% AI generated or something like that, uh, which would be a pretty big surprise if that turned out to be true. So personally, I would not rely on that. And even if someone like engages in some saber rattling and they're like, we're going to run all our submissions through an AI detector, it's like, I don't think that that's really going to hold because they're going to probably have a lot of miss, uh, false, false positives with handwritten uh, work. My personal point of view is that I don't really care if it's AI written or human written, but other people do care, so... I think it's nice to be honest, but I also don't think that anyone should feel like they have to reveal their process. I mean, there's people who hire ghostwriters and then don't tell anyone that it was ghostwritten. That to me feels kind of a similar level of, or similar kinds of questions. Bible being AI generated is a whole new theology. Yes, maybe we should start a new religion. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to end the class here, but thank you all for coming. And if you have other questions that you want to ask, you can find us on Slack. Thank you so much for uh, asking cool questions and participating, and I'll see you online. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.